Hello and welcome to this presentation on how to spot a predatory publisher. My name is Claire Sewell and I'm the Research Support Skills Coordinator in the Office of Scholarly Communication at Cambridge University Library. This presentation will help you explore the idea of predatory publishers and give you some tools to help you and your research community spot and hopefully avoid them. So these are the topics we'll be covering in this presentation. We'll look at what predatory publishers actually are and why they might be a problem, some warning signs to watch out for, and then a checklist to help you assess a potential publisher. We'll start by looking at what a predatory publisher actually is. So it's hard to find a concrete definition, but all of the suggestions follow along similar lines. The first definition is from scholarly communication librarian Geoffrey Beale, who first popularised the phrase predatory publisher. He specifically defines predatory publishers as those who are exploiting the gold open access model, and it's certainly become more of a problem since open access started to be adopted globally. The second definition on the screen is from Peaches Udoma, a non-librarian who works helping researchers to publish. She defines them a bit more widely, saying that it's any publisher which operates an exploitative business model. Finally, we have a definition from Wikipedia, who again talk about exploiting open access publishing models, but expand a bit more into the actual how of how these publishers operate by charging authors to publish without offering any of the services that the fees should pay for. In all of these definitions, the word exploit or exploitative comes up a lot, which is key. The perception of predatory publishers is that they're there to exploit those who use them. So, what actually is a predatory publisher? It's quite hard to define, as we've seen in the previous slide, lots of different definitions. But they often contact potential authors directly via email to offer to publish their work. Of course, traditional publishers also do this, but they tend to be a little bit more selective in who they approach. Predatory publishers have access to lists of potential authors from university websites, repositories, various email lists, and they just randomly spam people, usually not long after they've started to publish and their name is starting to become known. These publishers will charge to publish your work, and they call this an open access charge. But really, they don't provide any of the publication services that the author would expect to get for paying that charge, so things like peer review, quality assessment. We'll look at that in more detail in a moment. Essentially, what they are is a type of vanity press, because the author is paying to have their work in print or indeed digital copy. The problem really is that they're not always upfront about what they are and what their services are, so the authors think they're publishing through a traditional legitimate academic route. A lot of researchers often get confused about the differences between open access publishing and predatory publishers, so it's worth just pausing for a minute to have a look at that. The open access publishing model charges a fee to make work accessible. In part, this covers the sort of lost revenue from people not taking out subscriptions to a journal or buying a physical copy of a book. But it's also to cover the cost of publication services, so things like peer review, editing, proofreading. Predatory publishers just take that money and publish something as it is, as they get the manuscript. So the author is essentially paying for services that they're not receiving. We've talked a lot about peer review so far, so why is that so important? Essentially, it's there to check the quality of the research being published. Without it, you get low quality research slipping through to the publication stage. Predatory publishers often offer really quick turnaround times, which can sound really attractive if you're trying to get something out there, but I mean that anything that gets published as long as the fee is paid. As a result of this, poor research is published and essentially legitimised, which is the opposite of what's supposed to be happening with the research that's been through a proper peer review process. Peer review also helps to spot errors and crucially it raises any concerns about the research like results or methodology before it gets to the publication stage, which should limit any potential damage from publishing unsound research and putting it out into the academic arena. Some people have tried and succeeded in tricking predatory publishers into accepting substandard work to prove that the peer review process isn't taking place. And on the screen now, you have some of my favourite examples that I found. 
The first paper seems to have been written by characters from The Simpsons and someone from North Korea in an interesting collaboration and was actually accepted by two journals for publication and was actually published in one of them. The second paper was published, complete with a selection of graphs, and just features the one phrase, but without the uh, censorship you see on the screen there, just repeated over and over again throughout the paper. Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs has a title that's inspired by an American serial advert, and the actual paper was made up by a random text generator. Now that was actually accepted for publication by 17 different journals. My favourite is the last um, title on the screen there, which was a paper written by scientists from the Centre for Research in Applied Phonology, that's CRAP for short, C-R-A-P, which was just another selection of random words that was accepted for publication. But it does illustrate some of the things that are slipping through the net. Now we're going to talk about why they are a problem. The answer is that we need to take a step back and have a look at why people publish in the first place. So, of course, that slide with all the, uh, the funny titles on was quite amusing, but we do actually have a bit of a serious problem. Of course, most researchers are publishing because they have to, for the sake of their academic careers, but they also do it to enhance their academic reputation. So publishing is still seen by a lot of people as the gold standard of academia. And publishing in the right journals or with the right publisher helps to promote the reputation of the individual researcher. It also helps to increase the visibility of a piece of work and helps them to get ideas out into the public arena outside academia so other people might see it. Publishing provides a, a record of the research and proves that the author has done the work and made the discovery that they're recording. Finally, publishing means that the authors can get recognised for that work and that's both by their peers within their discipline and the wider world outside academia. So with that in mind, why are predatory publishers such a problem? Well, they limit the chance for the author to publish with a recognised reputable publisher. Researchers will most likely sign away their copyright to the work when it's published with one of these publishing houses. And that makes it impossible to publish with someone else, even if the author then realised that the predatory publisher that they've um, been working with isn't offering them what they want. Some people have found that they can actually withdraw their article or manuscript, but they do face a very heavy charge for doing this. It's almost like the work is being held to ransom. Now, for some, that is a price that is worth paying to protect their reputation, but a lot of people can't actually afford that. Publishing in one of these journals does absolutely nothing for an academic reputation in really extreme cases, it can have a negative effect. So even if the individual work is sound, perfectly fine, potentially it's sitting next to a work that's substandard or even wrong, or even one of those silly examples that we saw earlier. Researchers then have essentially a poor quality publication that sits on their CV, does nothing for their chances of promotion, and is a bit of a wasted opportunity to do more with that work. Above all, Publishing with these publishers perpetuates bad research. Manuscripts are sometimes retracted, but the publishers often leave them accessible because they don't really care. And that means that they're still out there and people can come across them. And they use them and they don't realise that potentially this could be damaging information. However, in some circumstances, you can see that this type of publishing is actually a legitimate business model. It does depend a little on the country where the author of the publication is based. So there's an argument to be made that academics at a large research institution like Cambridge, they have the resources to support traditional so-called legitimate publication. But for others at less established institutions, there might be issues when it comes to sharing their work. In some countries, there's a requirement to have publications on your CV, and using a paid-for publisher achieves this goal with the minimum of fuss. So if you think about it like that, what's the problem? Different reward systems actually lead to different behaviours. So as with the first point, if all the author is aiming for is publication, then what's the harm in paying for it? They're guaranteed to be accepted, so they don't have to waste time submitting to different journals, waiting for that rejection letter, and they can just get their work in print, which is what they want. 
if that's all that they're after, then does it really matter how they're getting there? In light of all this, you could, I stress the word could, argue that these publishers have a, a viable business model. They're providing a service that people are willing to pay for and fulfilling that need as part of a changing publishing landscape. I just want to take a moment to touch on predatory conferences as well. So some of these publishers are branching out into offering actual face-to-face -face events and the model for these is sort of the same as their publishing model. They'll approach a potential speaker with a really flattering email, ask them to be involved either as a speaker or a session chair, with the promise of working with some of the most respected figures in the field of study. Obviously, this is really flattering, especially if you're at an early stage of your career and you're looking for experiences for your resume. The problem really is that these companies are just in it for the money and they don't really have any interest in furthering knowledge that the attendees might well, but the companies that organize these conferences don't. As a result, they've got little or no selection process and the attendees and speakers actually pay a lot of money to attend. So I've heard of people um, flying from America over to China, vice versa, all around the world. It's cost them a lot of money, which often has to come out of their own pocket and they don't really get anything from it. There are also reports that these companies hold as many as six concurrent conferences in the one hotel at the same time, so it makes it a little bit of a squeeze and doesn't really say that they're in it for academic merit, but more in it for the money. So this next section is going to look at some of the basic warning signs that should send up a, a red flag with any publisher that you might be approached by. So these publishers actively solicit content, usually via email. So it's important to watch out for an overly flattering tone. They really are just trying to appeal to your ego if they, if they tell you about you know, the wonderful job that you're doing and how eminent you are in your profession. They're, they're really they're trying to, to flatter you into accepting. If the publisher covers everything from biology to baking, then you should probably be a little bit wary. Most journal publishers focus on a couple of interconnected areas. So if they cover a really, really wide range, it might be a sign that they're just looking to maximize their profits rather than publish serious research. Any fees that the author has to pay as part of the publication process need to be made clear up front. If an author starts the publication process and the publisher then starts asking for extra fees, then that's the time you should start to get suspicious. Finally, be wary if the publisher is promising you a really fast turnaround time. So proper peer review and preparation takes some time. So if the publisher offers to have something published in maybe a couple of weeks, it's likely that they'll just be accepting a manuscript as is and you won't be getting the proper service you're paying for. What follows now is a, a checklist of some things to think about if you or one of your researchers suspects that they've been approached by a predatory publisher. It's important to remember not to rely on any one of these factors in isolation, but use them as a group to help build up a picture of the publisher that you're working with. So first off, think about transparency. Think about if the publisher is generally open about their practices. Do they share their location, their contact information, mission statement? Is that readily accessible on the website? It can also be worth using Google Maps to get a street view of the registered headquarters, as I have come across cases where the registered headquarters turns out to be a suburban bungalow, which is perhaps not what you would expect from a multinational publisher, and that might throw up a big red flag. Think about if the publisher covers that wide range of topics or if they're focused on one particular area because, as we've just said, publishing on a wide range might indicate that there's a desire to make money rather than promote good research. Check if the invitation to publish has come from a named person and that they're addressing you correctly. So if, they, if you are a doctor, are they calling you doctor? If you're not a doctor, are they calling you doctor? And check that the email address is official and not something generic like a Gmail or Yahoo address because if it's an official publisher, it should have an official type address. 
you can look for mistakes in spelling or grammar as well, but do be aware that the, these publishers might employ people who, for whom English is not their first language, so give them the benefit of the doubt in some circumstances. Author fees need to be clearly explained and easy to find on the publisher website. Remember to look at fees that might not always be explicit. So always read the small print to see if the author is expected to do anything. So for example, purchase a certain amount of physical copies of the book as a condition of publication. These are all, all hidden fees which come up later that you might not be aware of upon signing a publication agreement. The publisher again should be upfront about the rights that the author will retain after publication. Especially if they claim to be publishing open access, check if there's a Creative Commons or other type of open license that will be applied to the work, which will make it shareable and usable. And check that the copyright policy, particularly of journals, complies with any funder requirements that the individual researcher might have. So if the funder requirements specify that something has to be shared in a certain way, will the copyright agreement with this particular publisher allow you to do that? The process of peer review needs to be clearly described and again easy to find on the website. And it really needs to go into enough detail to make the author feel confident that a thorough review will be carried out. You need to be wary of the really fast peer review turnaround times. Good peer review requires a little bit of thought and often by very busy people. So if the publisher is telling you that it can be done in a couple of working days, that's quite unlikely. It's either going to be really shoddy peer review or more likely no peer review at all. If the journal claims that it has a certain impact factor, then it's a good idea to check with other sources, independent sources, to see if this is correct, as some tend to use a sort of high impact factor to encourage publication when really they've just plucked a number out of thin air. With the editorial board, again, this information should be easy to find online. You need to check that there is one person listed as the named editor-in-chief as well as all the other board members, because that editor-in-chief has overall responsibility for the publication. The author needs to think about if they recognise any of the names on the list of board members. So are they recognised people in the field? Do they have listed affiliations that you would expect to see on this type of board? Or are they new names that you've never really come across? Again, you don't know everybody in your field, so it might be that they are just new names to you, but it's something to bear in mind. It can be worth checking if the people listed actually know that they're on the board. Some of the more unscrupulous publishers have been known to sort of take names of experts without permission, put these up on their website and claim that these people are involved with the journal when they're in fact not, and these people have absolutely no idea until someone contacts them. On that last note, most genuine people that sit on editorial boards won't object if you contact them to ask about their experiences with the journal. It's all part of the job. You can check if the publisher is a member of a recognised industry association that vets its members, so that will give you a bit of reassurance about the quality of the publication. And the same is true of publishers affiliated with recognised institutions like a university press, although it's worth double checking if you're at all suspicious, as again, publishers have been known to hijack names of institutions as well as individual people. Most publishers will have some sort of web presence, so take a look and see if it looks professional to you. In particular, watch out for multiple spelling and grammar mistakes, as this might indicate that things are put together in a hurry and are more about luring you in than promoting the publisher. Again, it's prudent to be aware of cultural differences, so what might be considered sophisticated web design in Western culture might be beyond the reach of some other people. So treat with a bit of caution with that one. You can check if the journal is indexed by the sort of typical databases that you would expect it to be indexed in that field. If you can't find the particular journal, then 
try looking for other titles by the same publisher because it might be that the journal is just too new to be indexed. And again, remember that there are perfectly legitimate reasons why a journal might not be in an index. It might be too new, it might be very niche. Don't rely on this as the only factor, but have a look and see if the publisher has any other publications where you would expect them to be indexed. One of the biggest indicators of whether a publisher is predatory or whether it's a quality publisher is looking at the previous publications, those previous outputs. Try and get hold of some of that and assess it for quality. Is this something you would be happy to be associated with? Is it something you would be happy for your work to be sat alongside? Think about the titles and the abstracts of articles in particular that appear in some publications and check if these actually do reflect the content. So especially in science or medical subjects, you can often have quite a lot of technical terms. And if uh, an editor or a publisher is not particularly familiar, they won't necessarily spot where the terms don't actually match the content. So that should throw up a big red flag and has been known to happen. Above all, use your judgment and trust it. If something is ringing an alarm bell, then it's always worth double checking just to be sure. Think of it in terms of doing some online shopping. So if something looks suspect, you don't immediately hand over your credit card information, no matter how cheap the price is. You check it first, you look at other sources, you see what else is out there, and you double check that this is a legitimate site. If you apply that same thought process to handing over your manuscript, you should be fine. Just remember that if something feels wrong, it probably is. I just want to leave you at the end of this presentation with a few top tips when it comes to dealing with predatory publishers. If the information about any of those areas on the checklist isn't available, then you should be asking why. There might be a perfectly legitimate reason, but always question if the publisher has something to hide before you proceed. Remember that all publishers operate under different circumstances. So there are differences in culture and award systems between countries and things like that. Don't just dismiss something out of hand because it doesn't fit your ideas. Trust your judgment above all else. Honestly, if you're getting that gut feeling that something isn't right, that is your gut trying to tell you something and you should listen to it. I've included some links to further information here, including written guidance from the Office of Scholarly Communication in Cambridge on predatory publishers and how to spot them, as well as some discussion about whether predatory publishers are in fact a problem, which is quite thought provoking, and Think, Check, Submit, which is a really good website which can help you assess the quality of a publication. Thanks for listening.